family and I will be sharing. I want to read out of 2 Corinthians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God. Someone say the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which, which we ourselves have been comforted by God. Has anyone ever been comforted by the Lord in hard times? And Hebrews 4 and 16 says, Jesus, our high priest, not only understands the facts of our infirmities, but he understands the feelings of our infirmities. We know sometimes that life is unfair, but God is always good. And in this room, there is healing this morning. We welcome the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's pray. Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit this morning. We thank you, sir, for helping us to give Christ glory. Bless and strengthen my children, Lord, as we honor how you alone brought us through what was inconceivable to us. And should anyone today, Lord, ever doubt it's by strength of man, it is not. It is by your hand, Lord God. It is by your strength and it is by your presence that we have walked forward and we won't fail to give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I'm going to set this up. I'm not preaching, but my children wanted me to set it up and end it. I'll be up there with them. But you know, in my house I grew up with, there was always a living room, Brother Gerald. And in that living room, um, only dignitaries could sit. My dad was a pastor's to pastors, and we would have missionaries and dignitaries from our denomination come. And we lived in parsonages. My mother didn't build the house that way, but there was always a formal living room where you could just peer in and look, but you couldn't go into. Sometimes I'm concerned in our life of faith that we have made rooms like that. Rooms that we can't go into or talk about or let Christ come into. I mean, our joy and celebration as a church and the kingdom of Christ all over the world today is wonderful and it's marvelous. But what do we do when we encounter anger, grief, and loss? These are all emotions. And you know, God did not create you to be a robot. He gave you those emotions on purpose. He is not afraid of your emotions. He's not offended by your emotions. But sometimes we think there's a room that we've kind of roped off and we don't have permission to go into. Places where we wrestle things. I say today, as I've said since I've become the lead pastor, and my husband said before me, this will always be a church where you can wrestle with your fears, you can wrestle with your doubts, you can wrestle with your pain, you can confront what you cannot confront. This will always be a community where it's okay not to be okay. Can I get an amen? Because people are looking for someone to help them walk through that. Because those emotions are, you know, I'm I know I'm supposed to have faith, but I'm afraid. I know I'm supposed to be joyful, but I feel depressed. I know I'm supposed to have hope, but I've got despair. And sometimes we don't think that we are allowed to sit in that room of grief, but you are allowed to sit in the room of grief. You're allowed to sit in the room of anger. You're allowed to sit in the room of frustration. Uh, what we've got to do is invite King Jesus into those rooms and find people that will help us wrestle our doubt and not just say to us, well, the Bible says I'm a biggest proponent of the Bible. It is my thing. It's my deal. It's my everything. That and my presence of Jesus. But we've got to be willing to wrestle with a culture and help them to wrestle some doubt out of their mind and explain things to them they cannot understand. Can I get an amen? We live in a time where we feel pressure to say, everything's okay. How are you today? Everything's okay. Well, that statement is true that everything will be okay, but there's days it's not okay. And there's moments it's not okay. And it's okay not to be okay. And I will tell you, as I say to every leader in this house, everyone that ever shares this pulpit, it's always okay not to be okay. It's always okay to say, I'm having a bad day. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like being here. I refuse to be part of a religious church that puts up facades. I want to be part of a whosoever community that gives permission for people to wrestle their grief. Because sometimes we think it's disrespectful to wrestle with grief. But you know, an entire book in the Bible is called Lamentations. How about that? And that means to lament questions, doubt, and pain, things that don't make sense about your life to find a place because your pain is worthy your doubt is worthy 
the things you don't understand are worthy. God took time from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament to process things with people. And then King Jesus came onto the scene and he processed with a woman with the issue of blood who doubted why she had not been healed for so long. He had the mercy to walk with her to doubt and to heal her. He helped the man with the withered hand, the lepers, those caught in shame. I love that he understands who we are. Someone say amen. And I wish this morning, as I begin to share my part, that there was three steps of getting out of grief, but there's not. In fact, we sat together, my family and I, um, and talked about this. And there's one point we all laughed so hard we couldn't hardly stand it, because that's just the way it goes. But in that, you know, we were laughing about there's no three steps. It's just a process. Anything you're going through, sometimes God heals instantaneously, but sometimes it's a process step by step. So my husband was, um, we found out he had an aneurysm in his heart. We were actually being tested in 2020 for COVID because Christine had it and uh, we wanted to be good stewards. It was a Saturday and they found his heart in, um, in, the, in the wrong rhythm, AFib. And they sent us down to Memorial and then through many tests, seeing the best heart surgeon in the Tennessee region, they found out he had aneurysm in the wall of his heart. It was to the size that he was scheduled to have another ultrasound. They put him on all medicine. He was doing all that good. He was not riding that bicycle like he should. I'm just going to call him out on that. But besides that, we went and bought a bike, and, he's, and he'd, he'd watch five minutes while he watched Criminal Minds. He goes, I'm done. I'm going to sit down now. Um, I just loved his humor. miss it so much. Um, but um, he was really sick in September, and we didn't know what it was. We went to the doctor. They checked him out for things they didn't know, just found an abscessed tooth. He had that abscessed tooth removed that's not connected to what happened, but that he became so sick during this time and he continued to be sick. His dad was promoted to heaven while he was sick. We spent a lot of time those two weeks worshiping and praying. Then one night I went up and um, he, we'd been sitting there before I went upstairs and he said, Rhonda, I turned the page Ooh, and I see my dad. And then I turned another page and I see Angel, our son, and then I turn another page and I see my cousin Kent and I said, honey, what are you trying to tell me? What do I need to do? He said, I want to sort it out. God and I will sort it out. I just need you to sing. <laughs> and so I sang. I sat there with him and I sang, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And the Spirit of the Lord just began to pour all these songs through me. I forgot I even knew songs from our evangelistic days and worshiped. And Holy Spirit created an atmosphere and Holy Spirit brought back songs of our days of revival. I didn't even remember and he'd weep. He's okay, I'm good now. Then a little bit later, he goes, sing to me again. He rested, he was gonna get some ice cream. I went upstairs to take a bath. When I came downstairs, he collapsed. A lot of this, you know. So I'm gonna go through this briefly only for those who are listening by podcast. He was out, I called 911 and they began to talk me through it. Um, to try to bring him back. I knew that he was gone. I had no idea he would stay gone. And uh, the lady at the 911, Lee, I know you work there now, told a friend of mine that worked there that it was one of the hardest calls because she could hear me calling out to the Lord and calling out to my husband to come back. The paramedics arrived and the police and just filled my house, great people with encouragement and love. And a paramedic who was there was in the room because they took him to the hospital. They couldn't get a pulse. They intubated him. They went to the hospital. You know, I was in that room by myself. This is 1.30 in the morning. No one knew but me at this time. And um, the doctors had come in and say, you know, your last goodbyes. It's been an hour. What in the world happened? I said, nothing happened. In fact, they'd given him a bottle of narcotics, but he refused to take them. I still had them in my purse. And, um, and so he said, come in and say goodbye. And then when I went in, you know what happened. I found this when I was looking for pictures from the paramedics, very well known here in Ghost of First Baptist, a lovely woman of God that came into my home that night and was in the room. She said, last night at work, I literally watched a woman speak life back into her husband. Right before my very eyes, the call had not gone as planned, but I'd done all I knew how to do and he was still pulseless in the ER. His wife was allowed in and she began speaking to him, encouraging him. And the moment she touched his feet to let him know she was there, he regained a pulse. I've never seen a miracle like this in all the years of being a paramedic. Come on, someone give God praise for that. And uh, that brought him back, which we believe gave us time to say goodbye, but we fought like crazy in faith as we do. I remember the scene in that, again, by myself, 
But I want to say to you this morning, you may feel at times that you are alone, and I looked alone. I'm sure people thought, man, this is so sad. Um, and one time I had a blanket over me. I, I'm about half laying on his chest, praying and speaking to him. He never regained consciousness. But I know looking back, I was not alone. And you may feel alone, but King Jesus will always walk with you. He will always be there. About 3.30 in the morning, one of the nurses, they just once said to me, man, he must really love you. And, of course, I was still so weak. I said, we just serve a big God. And I went home. They said, go home, sleep for two hours. We're putting him in intensive care, and we're going to need you to leave, and you need a couple hours rest. I went home, and I curled up in a little... <laughs> in a little ball on, on my bed. Still no one knew but me and King Jesus. I was not afraid. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Because I sensed his presence so strong, but I was dying inside, literally dying, literally dying. After two hours, I called my children, breaking that news. It's horrible. Called my elders. That was Wednesday morning. And the church was coming that night, and I told them that night the church began to bombard the parking lot you know us harvesters don't try to keep us out of anywhere we bombarded the parking lot praying the spanish church pastor ramon relentlessly prayed people prayed all over the world for a miracle one of the sweetest moments and we may go past 12 is that okay i'm almost done but it's, um it's a little later getting up here today but um one of the sweetest moments mike quell you'll love this I heard some men outside my window, and I opened my window, and there was a group of men that Pastor Hank, I mean, they were halfway always high. I mean, in fact, one of them in that prayer group was looking for marijuana in my yard. I said, there's no weed in my yard. We've never had weed. We're never going to have weed. And, uh, and the other guys are trying to keep him focused. <laughs> but the one in the center, Michael D'Andrea, grabbed this little ragtag group of renegades that Hank Davis loved. To hear them pray through my window crushed me because he called him Father Hank because he was raised a Catholic. <laughs> and these not even be able to put words together, which I think was so holy to you, Lord. It was so holy to me. They had no polished prayers. They had no seven steps to a deliverance. And I'm for all of that. You know I'm for all that. But just to hear their heart-wrenching prayer, please save the one who has saved us. So very precious. And those days in the hospital um, were, were intense. My children will be coming in just a moment. We're intense. The church anointed a handkerchief, and I know this is tough, but that is Pastor Hank's arm. And his hand wrapped with that handkerchief. The nurses were awesome, Mama Linda. The doctors, pretty good. <laughs> the nurses ruled and reigned. They were Jesus with skin on. And one of them who knew Leanne and really got a heart for me said, you're killing all these nurses. I was always very quiet by myself, and they're going around the bed. The kids made some visits during that time, but we're going to get to the day he went to heaven. But I would just sing, and I told him, I said, I've married you twice. If you come back, I'll marry you three times. <laughs> we'll do this we'll do that and uh he had signed the contract on the church or he'd approved it but it went through while he was in there and my elder said whisper that to him but the nurse said you're killing the nurses and i said what do you mean he said well you're very quiet but they walked down here just to look in at you to watch you walk out your faith I'm not saying that for any reason but to give Jesus glory that in the hardest moments, his people always rise to the occasion. Amen. And in your hardest moment, Jesus will allow while you're going through the biggest pain to show his glory. And uh, as I said, my father-in-law passed away, and that was a very horrible, bad day that we had to go help do his service here in town while my husband was on in ICU on a machine. And a very horrible, bad day. At the end of that day, I went to see my daddy on his 90th birthday and um, that night after being there and I sat down in that room because we're talking about sitting with gr in grief and kids were getting close here just one more minute and I said to my daddy happy birthday and then I just started wailing and I said daddy why why would Jesus take Hank I'm fighting as hard as I can 
<laughs> but daddy, why? And the more I said why, the more I just wailed. My beautiful daddy who has doctorate in theology, he's, he's 90, so things have changed, but this beautiful daddy that's been all the world, he didn't try to answer my questions, but he just lifted his hands and began to wail to the Lord. And I remember hearing him say, Jesus, we don't know why, please say, and he just worshiped and he cried with me and he cried. He allowed me to sit in the room of grief with him and he sat with me and I wanna be that kind of person, amen. I wanna be that kind of person. Then after I stopped crying, so hard. I said, well, happy birthday, Daddy. <laughs> happy birthday. He told my sister he was so glad I came, but if my children were come join behind me now, would you give them a hand as they come? <clears throat> the day that we were told that he would pass, um, I was dying inside. I've told my children to be as honest as they want to be because they're going to help you today. And as we worshiped, we had a playlist that we'd put together of his favorite songs. But when the doctor saw my children come in, he goes, they're so young. And I thought, do I look like I'm 150? <laughs> I was thinking that in my mind. But uh, I want to say, seeing my children, I was on this side of the bed, and Christine was here, and, and most times she was at his feet. And Michael kept his hand on Pastor Hank's head. We were leaving to the end. And Courtney was across me, but to see those children stand there gave me such strength. We invest in our children. And Hank Davis always said, someday I'll stand before King Jesus. And when I do stand before him, he said, I want to have my wife on my left side and my children on my right side. Well, King Jesus, here we are again. Tell Hank his children have come to share the gospel of Jesus. Would you give them a hand as they come? Courtney's going to go first. Okay, I'm going to be as real as I can with you guys. Um, my dad was my hero in so many ways. There was never a time when I thought he couldn't solve something or fix something for me, no matter what it was. Anytime I went to my dad to ask him for something, his words were, absolutely, I'll make it happen. And if he couldn't do it on his own, he would pull all of the resources he could to make a way. But my dad was also my hero in helping me find my own relationship with Jesus. Since I was a little girl, my dad told me that he didn't want me to see God as the God of my parents or the God of my grandparents. He wanted God to be the God of me. And he wanted me to have my own real raw relationship with Jesus, along with my mama. They both helped me carve out my own relationship with Jesus. He showed me what that looked like with his actions, not just his words. I would hear him having coffee in the morning and praying. I would hear my mom praying. And I know for sure that is one of the many reasons why I can stand here today. When heaven came for my dad, my faith and my belief in God was shaken. In the hospital, we listened to worship music. We shared our favorite stories about him. We laughed, we cried. There were times when my mom was just praying in tongues. She couldn't speak in English. And we were listening to music, of course, and praying. But I just stood there in anger. I don't deny that God wasn't with us in that room. But honestly, I could care less in that moment. I was so angry with him. I remember thinking, really, God, we're here again. You and I are in another room where someone that I love is fighting for their lives. And I know that if a miracle does not happen, you're going to come for him. And after Daddy was promoted to heaven, we came to the church that night to have a special prayer. And everybody was smiling and waving because they didn't know yet. And I had to fake a smile when the insides of me were being ripped apart. 
and we had this full-blown worship service and I wish I could tell you that I got involved but I didn't feel like worshiping I kept thinking what kind of God is this what kind of God are you <laughs> to be honest I didn't know if I wanted to be a part of this anymore I had to walk through loss as a widow being a single mom and now I am here again walking through loss without a daddy what kind of God would allow this again he can just say the word and daddy could have Woke, but he chose not to. I don't know why he did it, but in my human mind, I couldn't grasp to serve this kind of God that would cause this pain. I know he didn't do it, but this is what my thoughts were going through in that moment. I was fighting to hold on to him, and at times I felt like I was fighting for my life. I was ready to walk away from my relationship to God. I told a few people that I trusted so they could pray with me that I was hanging on for dear life. And I was struggling with everything I have ever believed in. I may have been done with God, but he was not done with me. There was a moment when I was at home by myself and I was wearing my dad's shirt to feel close to him. I still do that a lot. But I was still filled with so much anger. I was mad at God that this was our lives now. I was mad at God that my innocent little eight-year-old had to experience this much loss at a young age. I was trying to keep myself busy because that's what girls do. And so I was cleaning. And all of a sudden, the Lord took me back to a place where I was having lunch with my dad. And it was like I was there. I mean, it was so real to me. And we were talking about things in life, and I was battling with some depression and wanted to be farther along in my life. And he just wanted to sit with me in the middle of it because that's what dads do. And it took me back to a place where dad had looked at me and told me, I'm still angry with God that he took an angel. And in that moment, it was like the tables flipped, and I was no longer sitting with my dad on earth, but I was sitting with my heavenly father. In Exodus, God tells Moses, I am that I am. And to me, this means that God will be whoever you need him to be in that very moment. If you need a friend, he becomes your friend. If you need a spouse, he becomes your spouse. God knew how much I needed a dad to sit with me in my anger. And that is exactly what he did. I felt that he was letting me know, hey, it's okay to feel everything you're feeling. It's okay to question me. It's okay to not understand why life is this way. He let me know it was okay to be angry with him. I felt raw and exposed in front of him, but he was reassuring me I didn't have to hide this. He could handle it. He could take this. It wasn't a supernatural Holy Ghost moment. He didn't come rushing in to save me. He just came to sit with me the same way a daddy would sit with their daughter. Right. I knew I was not alone and did not have to carry this burden alone. And that's how it's been for the last two years. Because grief doesn't go away. You learn to live with it. The anger still comes in. The feelings of confusion still come in. But when they come in, here comes my daddy God to come sit with me yes. in the middle of it to let me know, hey, yes. it's okay, but I've got you. The same way a dad holds a girl in his arms to let them know that he loves them, that's the same way my daddy God has been holding me. Let me know, hey, I got you. Yes. The best way I know how to explain this is, when my daughter wakes up in the middle of the night screaming for me because she's in fear, I come running, and she knows by just my presence being there, she will be okay. And that's how I know I am going to be okay, because I have the presence of Jesus sitting with me in the midst of my mess, in the middle of my depression, in the middle of my grief. 
he is right there saying, hey, we've got this together. I'm going to walk you through this. You're not alone. You're not on your own. You're not fatherless on earth. I am here with you, holding you up, and I've got you. So I'm going to turn over to my sister because I probably went too long. But my dad will always be my hero because if he and mom had not instilled that in me when I was so young, I probably would not have been able to hold on to Jesus. I would have easily just walked away and said, you know what, I'm done. But because they stirred something in me when I was such a little girl, that stayed with me. That marked me to let me know, wherever you go, here comes Jesus running after you. Because I can't get away from him. I can't go anywhere without him. He is right there in the middle. So I want to encourage you today to allow Jesus to come sit with you in the middle of your mess. Whatever you need him to be, trust him that he will be that. Don't try to hide from him. Don't try to close those doors. Don't be ashamed of what you're trying to hide from him because he can handle it. He can take it. And the more you try to hide it, the worse it's going to get. But if you allow Christ to come in into every room that you're trying to hide and sit with you, I've noticed the longer Jesus sits with me, the lighter the burden becomes that day. I can make it through that day. I feel a little joy again. The anger kind of, you know, slips away at that moment because when Jesus is there, he brings everything together. When Jesus is there, he brings healing and he brings hope. And the more I sit with God, the more my hope is restored in him again. So don't hide those rooms. Let Jesus come in and sit with you. Amen. Well... Everybody pray, because Michael and I are the long-winded ones. <laughs> um, no, I, my sister and my mom did such a great job um, sharing, and I'm so proud of the both of them. I'm proud of Michael, too, and, you know, what we've all had to walk through. Um, when I think of my dad, I think he was probably the most human person I know, but he was also the perfect example of a man of God, um, which I think is is exactly what you want to have been said about you. Um, Yeah, I miss my dad so much. I think as time goes on, you know, so many people told me in the beginning, it gets easier. It doesn't. You just learn how to move with it Um, because it doesn't get easier. It's, you know, two years came around a few weeks ago, and for days before, um, I just felt a weight, and I couldn't figure out why. Um... And I realized that it was two years coming up. And I remember when it had been two weeks. And it was like, man, how has it been two weeks? Um, so two years is a long time without somebody who you love so much. Um, Pastor Tim called me the day of um, that it was two weeks. And he just called to check in and um, said that he knew I, I had missed him. And, and I said, I know you miss him too. You know, it's not just, it's not just us that he had such an incredible impact on. And we were his daughters, but it was the sons and daughters all around, the people that he loved, and he chose people. One thing that I love about him so much, and I pray um, that the rest of my family can take, is he sat with people nobody else wanted to sit with. That's right. He loved people no one wanted to touch. And he didn't just give a second or a third chance. He gave a 70th chance. It was, it was time and time again, no matter what somebody did to him. He was such a gracious man. Um, and, you know, constantly I refer to him as being my peace, which I learned now, you know, in his younger years, that was not true. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had a temper. And, um, yeah, me and Courtney grew up with two different dads. And uh, I'm sorry, Courtney, I got both amazing, both amazing, but I got the more easygoing and I'm so happy that I did because I think a lot of those traits that he had in his younger years fell onto me, which I'm so grateful for. And to for people to say that I'm anything like my father is and my mother is the biggest compliment that I'll ever receive. Um, I remember when we when I found out actually that um, Everything had happened the night before with Dad. Um, I was going into work. I was working at a daycare at the time. And um, I went upstairs, and Mom had told me. And, you know, looking back, I was in such denial. Um, And I did not realize it. But the things that I did the day before, none of it bad, but 
I just could not accept or go to the place um, that this was happening. And it was, you always think, well, that's never going to happen to me until it does. Um, you just don't think that it will. And I remember we talked as a family. We decided to go and be with him on his last day, which we didn't know it was going to be that. Um, and it was really a miracle that we went that day. And we, we spent uh, four to six hours with him. It was really a miracle that we were able to do that. Um, and I remember going, walking into the room. I could not face what was needed to be faced. Um, I had a wall in front of me that I did not want to tear down, half of it being pride. I didn't want to expose myself um, to being so emotional um, because this is hard. It's, it's a hard place to meet. Um, and I remember sitting there, and my family began to share, and I just asked the Holy Spirit, was like, open me up and allow me to go to the place that I need to go so that I do not look back and regret this day. Um, and I remember they were sitting there sharing, and what opened me up was I began to share a story of um, the last trip that Dad and I went to, um, which was to Oklahoma. It was his Aunt Navita's funeral, and it was a time. When I tell you that was a trip, <laughs> my uncle showed up drunk to the funeral. <laughs> people welling on the casket I mean it was really and you know I respect whatever somebody needs to do but it was really the Davis the Davis family are a dramatic bunch they're a crazy group I remember after the trip my dad said I am so proud of you that you are quiet <laughs> that you don't interrupt because if you're in a room with a bunch of Davises everybody's talking over each other nobody's respecting what the other has to say it is, but thankfully my dad was not that way. Um, he was very respectful, and I remember um, at that time that was really the beginning yeah. of some of his health conditions, and we didn't know it. Um, and we had a scare while we were there, and I remember him and I were driving um, back home one night. It, it might have even been from the funeral, and him and I had gotten on a kick. We played it today, the, um, what's the song called? When I Think About the Lord. Him and I had gotten on a kick of listening to that song, and um, I remember we were sitting in the car, and he asked me to play that song. And I was driving, and I was 17 at the time, and he was in the passenger seat. And um, we played that song over and over and over again. And every time it started, he began to weep and praise the Lord and thank him for what he had done in his life because he owed it all to him. And I remember that was such an important time to me to sit and reflect on who he was that I got to sit in the car with him and I remember I just had tears in my eyes as we were driving because his worship and his love made me want to worship and love God um I remember we were sitting in that room and you know sharing funny stories but also crying and and weeping and it's probably our last 30 minutes or last hour I really don't know what the timing was of all of that um but we were all over dad and had spoken things to him and had shared stories and we begin, we begin to play um, one of the last songs to a dance that he had seen which was that queen for a day and it was alabaster box which is a whole funny story within itself but we begin to play that and cry and declare over him and before this time, probably the last two and a half years of my life, I had really taken what felt like to me a blow after blow after blow. Um, and I had not experienced grief, but I had experienced what felt like grief for things I had lost in my life. Um, and I remember in that moment, I have always loved the Lord. I have always honored him. Um, but it had really been a blow the last two years for my relationship with the Lord. And I remember in that room, um, I felt like the Lord told me, um, when you worship me and sit at my feet, you're not only with me, but you're with your dad as well. Um, and when you're close to me, you're close to him. And in that room, I felt the presence, overwhelming presence of the Lord, like I probably never have. But I also felt an immense grief. Um, and they just went together. Um, after that, yeah, we came to the church, and um, we had a time of worship. So many things now I look back and are kind of a blur, um, but I try to remember as best as I can. Um, and after that, it has not been easy. You know, Mom said, this is a difficult thing to do um, 
because for me, I am as open and honest as I am, I'm also very private with my grief, and I'm not a huge fan of sharing it. Um, so it is very hard um, to walk through this and to share. But, you know, we were laughing, and I was saying what we needed to call this was Rhonda's Table Talk, Three Ways to Overcome Grief. <laughs> But there aren't three ways. You just continue to walk out. You continue to miss them. You continue to have moments that feel drowning. But it is the Holy Spirit that pulls you through. And, you know, after, this is in all honesty, after um, I really felt closest to the Lord than I, I feel like I probably ever have been. But it did not feel that way for the year to come. Um, I had very many ups and downs, and I was not happy with God. And I felt the same way my sister did. Is, is this the kind of God that you are? Because if this is the kind of God that you are, and all of these things have happened, that I really don't want to do this. Um, but when I wanted nothing to do with him, he wanted everything to do with me. And it's not about being happy with him. Now it's about, there's still times where I find myself upset with the Lord, and I love the Lord. But it's... Yeah. It's knowing that I don't really have to be happy or unhappy with him. It's not about that. It's about trusting That's right. that he will meet me in the place that nobody else will. That he'll meet me in that room of grief. That he'll hold me. That he'll carry me. That it's really not about me being okay with him. It's the fact that he's a father. There was many times where I was upset with my dad and I didn't like something he said or he did. But that didn't change the way he felt about me. And it's the same way with the Heavenly Father. It does not matter what we do or even what we think of him. His love and his grace and his mercy goes far beyond what we could ever think or imagine. And I just want to encourage you that, you know, in this room today, there is grief, there is loss, there is heartache. Things that we don't think we can ever walk through. But it is because of the mercy that is new every morning, like that song we sang this morning, that um, his mercy is the shade I'm living in. Yeah. He restores my faith and hope again. And I sang that this morning, and I was moved by it because he has become my mercy. He has be restored my faith and my hope again, just when I thought that it couldn't be. He has taken me to places that I didn't know were imaginable. And so today, he wants to meet you. It's, it's not about having the perfect words. I've said things I didn't think I was going to say today. I'm sure I left a million things out, but it's about, it's about coming to him and meeting him, no matter how you feel about him. You may be disgusted, you may be horrified, and that's just real. You may want absolutely nothing to do with God. You are so over this Christianity thing, this relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's not over it. And he will fight for you. He will love you. He wants to meet you in the rooms and the places where you don't want to go. And he wants to heal your heart today. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. You did awesome. Well, I think I could just drop the mic right there and that'd be it. Uh, these are some hard acts to follow, but um, uh, I just want to start off by saying what Pastor Hank was to me. Um, I know they both, sh or all three, have shared that Pastor is like Jesus with skin on. He would meet you where you was, just like Jesus would, no matter what what you were feeling, what you were needing, he would meet you there. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've heard stories where he would go down with the homeless and sit with them, take them cigarettes, take them what you and I look at as what we shouldn't be doing, but he would be taking them what they need, you know what I'm, <laughs> I mean, to get them through their day, because they're experiencing something we're not. I mean, at the moment. And that's what I loved about Pastor so much is he, and I think I can represent each one of y'all as, as being, he was a pastor, he was a friend, he was whatever you needed him to be, he was that. If you needed somebody to go to, to just cuss about everything. I mean, to <laughs> tell him how you felt, he was there to listen. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that's that's where he met you. He it wasn't about being he was the pastor right then, but he was what you needed him to be at that moment. And through those times, you know, we've all known Pastor. Some have known him for many years. Some have known him for a little, little bit of time. But each one of y'all got the feel what I felt. Whether I've known it, I've known him for thirty over thirty years, or whether you've known him one year, you met the same guy. He was who he was every time you met him. He was down to earth. He was exactly just like Jesus. He was who you needed him to be when you stepped in front of him. During my time of growing up, uh, I walked away from God at one time. And Pastor Hank met me where I was at my lowest point. He came down to the jail and spoke his mind and was able to get me out of there. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> it was, but, I mean, that's who he was for anybody. It didn't matter if you had been going here for 30 years or this was your first day through those doors. He would have did the same for you as he did for anybody, the, the longest member at this church. He was there for everybody. Uh, and in saying that, seeing this, seeing Pastor in this state that he was in, in this hospital bed, I was able to be there for him when when he needed me. <laughs> and and just like pastor even though we didn't know my outcome when I came to church <laughs> <laughs> But he met me where I needed to be. He met me at the jailhouse. And that's all I could do for him. I met him there, you know, where I needed to be at that time. I didn't know if my prayers were going to come through. I was believing up until the final breath that he was going to get up and walk out of there with us. But as we know that God had a different plan. And sometimes God's plan doesn't go exactly like we want it. And I know there's anger that comes with that. When God doesn't answer our prayer at a certain time. Or give us the answer that we actually wanted. We can look back later Sometimes that's a long time. That later may not have come yet for some of the things you're looking for those answers on. But looking back, you can see where God guided you through this or guided you through that. And even though the outcome was not where we wanted that day, God was prepping us, building us for who we needed to be. This church was found on the whosoever, by the whosoever. Uh, I mean, he was the greatest whosoever there could have been for this church. And him being who he was allowed me to step back through those doors after all I'd went through, all the bad choices I'd made, it gave me the strength to look back at God and say, God, you did it for him. I know you'll do it for me. Amen. The same thing for each of y'all. Yes. 
no matter if you've already went through it or if it's something you're going to go through later, those doors are always open and God's arms are always open wide, waiting. We, not be, we may not be always waiting on God, but God is always waiting on our re return. After, you know, like they had all said, we had come back in here to that Wednesday night. It was not easy. We had to make phone calls to best friends, phone calls to family, uh, and just meeting people that was not expecting the outcome that, you know, that, that the same one that we were not expecting. Uh, and facing each one of y'all was not an easy task. But thank God for each of y'all being who y'all are. Amen. And being the whosoever. Yes. And not only being that, but being family. Yeah. Because that's what we always are. I know Miss Tin, Pastor Todd mentioned it up here earlier the first time you're a visitor the second time through those doors you're family and that goes without saying each one of y'all are like family to us each one of y'all are there for us when we need y'all most Amen. and the same for y'all if y'all need us we're there when y'all need us most these last two years have not been easy for me, the family, or any of our family. But we've gotten through it with each other. And that is the most encouraging thing, that we, were th we are there for each other mm -hmm. through thick and thin, through the small times, through the large times, and all the in-between. And that's where I want to leave it right here, is just I encourage each of y'all through all those hurts and pains that we go through that we're afraid to tell the human beside us God is ready to accept it all. And no matter what we're going on, going through on the inside, always remember somebody is going through something. It may be a good day for them, or it may be the worst of worst. But your simple hello, shaking a hand, pat on the back, a hug. A, a comical story, uh, any words to them is an encouragement because you stopped and you took the time to focus on them, whether it's to tell a story, uh, listen, or to share what they've what they exactly need it in that moment. God put you there for a purpose and what you do in that purpose is exactly what God intended. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Amen. Musicians, Josh and Chris, if you would come. Um, Austin, we're just going to um, go quickly through those. I'm going to want to pray over you. They shared a lot of things I was going to share, so I'm just going to cut to the very end what we shared this morning is to give you hope that god can get you through anything that he will always be present here's what some interesting facts um, my dear friends perry and pam opened up omega center for the homegoing service and there we are the three the three amigos right there and um, marcus lamb came from daystar television and preached on hank davis is a prince of man joni 
was determined that the Daystar singers were here and flew them in on a jet and they led worship. And Billy Burke shared uh, about Hank Davis so many beautiful things. And then finally, uh, Phil Driscoll was a statement that night that none of us, I called Phil to say, you guys can go ahead and play when you're set up. I called him to say, can I, can I play I Exalt Thee? He said, no, you can't. And I said, okay. Um, he and Hank were very close. He said, oh no, I'm coming for my friend. I'm on the next plane. I'm bringing my trumpet. And he said a statement that night that pretty well encapsulates the life of evangelist and Pastor Hank Davis. He said, when the religious walked away from me, Hank Davis walked toward me. And if that's not how we should live, Phil faced some unbelievable and unfair odds and Hank kept pursuing him. It meant so much. Here's the thing that I wanna say. Omega Center, when people, sons and daughters came in from all over the country, it was packed, eight rows behind us. We didn't cry, any of us during that service, we worshiped. Pam said, I think I cried more than you. I said, I've done nothing but cry for two weeks, but we felt so safe. Hearing Pam were the ride of me, sons and daughters all the way back that loved him so dearly, my friends, my family, and we worshiped and we gave the Lord glory. And the odd thing is when everyone came into town, they kept texting me, do you know that this, his service is on Azusa Street? Because OCI has that, when you look it up, it's called Azusa Street, which is the great revival that changed the world. And here's the cool thing. So many people came that night. They've been part of our church through all those 30 years. And so many told us, I met him at a revival and I said goodbye to him tonight at a revival as the Spirit Lord. Can we give the Lord hand clap praise for that? I preached on the first Sunday to give you hope and glory. The kids said, we can't just throw all this out here and say, okay, y'all go have a great day now. Um, I said, don't worry. Um, but here's the thing. Um, I preached the first Sunday after he passed. My kids were worried, but my elders had installed me that afternoon. Our elders had installed me as the, the, the lead pastor of this church. That Sunday, I preached on crossing over. That sermon went viral all over the world through shares. People were astonished that a widow would get up on the first Sunday and preach as I began to chart the course for this future. I say that not. You think I am strong. I want to tell you in the presence of the Lord that I come from strong people, but it is He and He alone. He gives strength to the weary. He gives power to those who have no might. And whoever you are and whatever you face this week or the next week, don't you ever underestimate his power coming in. And since that day, the finances of this church have increased tenfold. The attendance has increased. The property has sold. We are now preparing for what our regions feel like will be the greatest day. And not only is it a little thing of whosoever, but it's a big thing. Billy Burke said, unless a seed fall to the ground, there can be no harvest. I don't understand why the seed fell to the ground. And I miss him terribly. But this I know. The disciples thought Jesus was irreplaceable when he went up. But they turned the world upside down. And we as a church are going to turn the world upside down. Just stand wherever you are and give him praise before I pray for you. Let's praise King Jesus with a hand clap of praise and honor for his strength and his might for us. So here's what I want to say. I'm going to pray over you. I want you to know whatever you need. Also, I have no idea what we're going to call this. Let's get creative on the podcast. I have, but I want to say this. Whatever room you're not wanting going today, I'm going to pray over you. Maybe the Lord will start a process today. Maybe it is anger. Maybe it is depression. Maybe it is fear. Maybe it is trauma. And maybe you don't feel allowed to go in that room, but I want to pray that you begin a process with King Jesus of letting him go into those rooms and sit with him. Tell him, as my children said, tell him what you feel. And I also want to encourage every one of you, whatever we go through with God, we are more than enough. Sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in this house today, I say to you, whatever you carry and you think you're not enough, if we could go through this, if I could 
come and take this church in a moment's notice by the presence of the Holy Spirit alone. If this church could start to climb to a place that Pastor Hank dreamed it could be, you are enough. You are qualified. Stop disqualifying yourself. The weight that you, you carry, it's a lot, but Jesus in you is more than enough. He is more than enough. He is more than enough. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, first of all, if someone came in here this morning and somehow you are away from King Jesus and you want to come back to him, this is a perfect moment. If you're here, I'm not going to come for you. I'm not going to even have you walk down the aisle. But if you would just lift your hand wherever you are so we can pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. We're going to pray with you in a moment right now in this room. Father, I pray, Father, for every situation in any hearts today. If there is a room of fear they don't want to go into with you, trauma, anger, disappointment, just can't make sense of what you're doing in their life, Lord. And God, if they don't invite you into the room, we could be facing them walking away from you. Lord, today I pray we invite you and welcome you into the rooms of our heart. There's people in this room right now, Lord, I know, that have great pain and great disappointments of things that have happened and didn't turn out right. There's people in this room that have questions they are wrestling with. And King Jesus, you welcome those questions. Lord, your apostle Paul said, I speak the grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit over you. And Lord, I speak that over each person. Lord, we invite you, King Jesus, into our room. As we go into this week, we open our hearts to you. If there's rooms, Lord, we need to just tell you about some things, let us feel free to do that. And Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for the whosoevers that this man Hank Davis started, a man who washed the feet of the indigent and washed the feet of the hurting in the attic. I pray, Lord, that right now we would take this commission and each one of us would receive the mantle of who we're to be in this local body. We would put our hand to the plow. We'd put our heart to the vision and we'd be ready to see you do the impossible. We thank you for it and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. Let's give him one more hand clap of praise. One for my kids. Did they do awesome?